a community access operation like ours is typically formed out of or during a franchise negotiation with the cable company and a, a municipality. It was a long one. The battle for PEG was, it started really, I mean, the needs assessment start, process really started in 97, 98. The city of San Jose wanted a robust access operation that many other communities enjoyed. And what we learned from the community was there were a lot of interest in PEG. 2000-ish, uh, that negotiation happened between Comcast and the city of San Jose. It was identified that there needed to be a nonprofit set up to manage access, and particularly public and education access. At that time, it was individual cities and cable companies that were negotiating. And finally, the franchise was signed in 2006. The interesting thing about it also was is that the franchise was signed like less than a month before the new state cable law went, went into effect, which eliminated the authority of cities to grant franchise. <laughs> The Board of Conveners were essentially a committee of people who were identified from within the community who were leaders in different arenas, okay? And that Board of Conveners then identified the first Board of Directors. That board had uh, elected me as the board chair, uh, and the first meeting that I chaired the board, uh, the city announced that it was uh, in a lawsuit with Comcast. As the story goes, Jerry D. Young's first <laughs> meeting as board chair was in about 2003 and it was his last meeting for four years. So that group of people hung in there through all the litigation, everything, and when we reconvened them in early 2007, almost all of the original board members were still available, still wanted to do it, but what it showed was that they were the right people. Okay, they were interested and they were so committed that they just hung in there for like four years waiting for this thing to really be able to happen. The new board members had a series of tasks that they had to complete. One was to begin to look for space. The more important one was to be looking for an executive director. And we were looking for somebody who clearly had management experience in running a community media center before. Somebody who had a lot of energy. Working mom, musician, <laughs> with, with Ruby and the Snuggly. And um, I'm getting these calls. I thought, ah, we're going to take a break. I'm going to call Sue and see what's going on. So I called her, and she says, listen, after all these years, San Jose is finally ready to hire an executive director and form a nonprofit. I do remember our first conversation. Suzanne was very enthusiastic about joining Create TV. Whoever came in as the executive director was going to have to get a new facility and open it up. That's where I came in on April 1st, 2008, and we had to open July 1st. <laughs> so, boy, that was a fun 90 days. When Suzanne arrived, we actually did this. Um, and, uh, you know, this was a life ring. Use only if you ever have that sinking feeling. You know, I just felt so welcomed and so supported. I knew it that, that day. I, I made the right decision, and I was happy to, to, to uh, lead the ship. <laughs> So the board wisely decided to start having a series of community meetings with these producers that at the time didn't really know what was going on. They, I don't believe, had been given the heads up from Comcast. We were inheriting some 150 producers from Comcast. They didn't know us. We didn't know them. It was rough. Um, there were a couple of producers that were skeptical and questioning, and, and uh, everybody was very surprised. We ended up ending, having four meetings with the producers over time. I think it was the second meeting that we introduced Suzanne, um, and then Suzanne helped lead us uh, uh, through that process. There was a lot of relationship building that had to happen between uh, the leadership at the time of our organization and these producers, some of which had the same you know, airtime for 20 years on Channel 15. They were very, that was probably the number one fear is, oh my God, you're going to change my airtime, uh, where we just listened. We listened and we wrote down their ideas. And that was the start of the relationship that we built over time. Suzanne stepped up and really began to show her leadership skills. The board kind of tuned ourselves down. Suzanne came up and, you know, as I say, the rest is history. Priority one after I was hired was we got to find a space. This facility here at uh, the Julian Street facility kind of came on our radar. And so I remember walking in, liked it. I wasn't totally ready to commit at first, but the more we talked about it and certainly the more time t was ticking by as I was looking at the calendar of my watch, I said, you know what? 
It has high ceilings. It's got free parking. It's got everything we need for our members. We got to go for it. It's, you know, we got into the space probably, I want to say, not the first week of June, but right after perhaps. And we had to be on the air July 1st. So uh, we had to go. <laughs> and I had already been in conversations in May with, with an engineer, Drew Cutlick. So I went and visited him in Milpitas where he was working on a job. I said, hey, Drew, and you know, kind of talking to him. And I said, so what are you doing the next two months? You know, I was almost afraid to ask him because this was just an overwhelming task. He stepped in and took charge along with uh, Justin Cowgill, who at the time was our director of facilities and technology. So we had five vendors in here at once. We had to put walls back. We had to uh, put a floor in, uh, build the entire control room. Um, put in the lighting grid, uh, with carpet going in, walls were being painted. I mean, it was just boom, boom, boom. And they delivered. I mean, I was just so impressed with our vendors and how well everyone worked together and we got it done. Uh, it, it's just worked out beautifully for us. First 90 days included hiring staff too and getting that whole structure in place. Priority number one was uh, somebody to operate playback, a programming director. Quickly identified who the programming manager would be. It was Luis Costa. He'd had experience doing this and, and uh, was ready to jump right in. As soon as we hired him, I had him fill out the paperwork. First, you know, second employee of Create TV. And I said, okay, here's the phone number for Tightrope Media Systems. That's our playback system. Here's the phone number. They're going to train you. I'll talk to you in three weeks. <laughs> I was on a phone conference with our playback people. We do playback for our channel. Talked to them for half an hour, and there we go. So and next, of course, was hiring our uh, director of facilities. That was going to be key, too. And, and, and this person was just going to have to hit the ground running. And so we identified you know, Justin Cowgill to, to be that person. And I, the thing I remember about the early days of Create TV with Justin are uh, when he walked in this space with me, I said, OK, here's where we're going to be. And you have like a few weeks to get everything done. Come see me when you need a check signed. <laughs> You know, and his jaw dropped. I mean, for somebody who has a passion around equipment and technology, um, this is, must have been kind of like a dream job. But then the hard part came. I say 90 days, <laughs> that, was, that was with Suzanne by the time Lewis and I were involved. So we only had two weeks just to get all the materials from the old Comcast and me getting trained up on the new system and everything and just getting on air. Justin's first day of work was moving furniture, though. All the cubicles you see and a lot of the desks we have, that we went and got that stuff with a U-Haul. And it's you and me, so let's roll. <laughs> he didn't balk at that, you know? That's what I knew, right? I got the right guy for this. And then, of course, bringing crew on and, and operations manager and all that followed pretty quickly. Uh, you just do what you got to do when you're, start, when you're doing a startup and when you work for a nonprofit. So Lewis's office was at City Hall and so was all our playback equipment. You know, I was just in a cubicle with like a bunch of other people that worked for the city of San Jose. So the time had come to actually do the switch over on the morning of July 1st from Comcast to Create TV. Now, God, it must have been like five or six in the morning. It was early when Comcast and Tightrope and the, everybody was gonna be on the phone or physically uh, at City Hall doing the switch. It's all this excitement and oh my God, it's finally happening, it's July 1st, yay. So it was just kind of just a switch and here you go. And they said, okay, it's done. Is this done? <laughs> An important moment in our history, but there wasn't exactly confetti falling from the ceiling, right? Uh, it, was just, it was a very happy time. It was a very exciting time uh, for us. Partly, too, because I knew what was coming, and I thought, gosh, we're going to have so much to offer these members and, and offer the community. So I think it was a combination of the facility, the locations, and I will say Suzanne's ability to very quickly connect with the community. You know, we had a few bumps on the road. There was communication issues with some of the producers. They were used to this routine, and we didn't have that routine here. And one thing I'm really proud of is that we didn't let things fester or linger. If, if there were problems, it was let's all sit down and talk about it. I'm grateful that that, that is a, a value that's really woven into this organization is, you know, get it on the table fast, get those conflicts resolved, and good customer service uh, is, is critical. I remember Jerry DeYoung ran in my office one day and he said, you need to fill out this application. It's for the redevelopment agency. It's a sign grant. And we all saw, saw the writing on the wall that redevelopment wasn't going to be around much longer. And uh, this was one of the last sign grants uh, uh, that they were going to give out. So, you know, I hurriedly uh, <laughs> filled that out and turned it in. And, and we were indeed able to get a grant from the city to um, have a sign put on uh, the top of our Julian Street facility here. And it was a lot of fun. 
We had a time lapse of it. I think it was on a Saturday or Sunday in the morning where I drove over the hill and came over here, watched it go up. Uh, and that was a big moment, you know. I have to say that sign has been the best PR and <laughs> marketing that we've had uh, uh, these last five years. It really sort of put us on the map. Finally ordered the rest of the components of the playback system and it was gonna come here and we were gonna get fiber to our facility and um, bring Lewis home. <laughs> when we finally got everything out of there and moved Lewis over here so he could now program over here, yeah. uh, we had a little, um, it's a boy and it's a girl balloon, um, and the balloon was for the playback system and there was the balloon for, for Lewis because Lewis was finally here. So that was an exciting day. I remember taking pictures of and video of the, um, uh, the truck rolling up and the huge three racks being you know, rolled into the facility and I remember pretending to crack champagne over the playback system and another milestone, another happy time, and, and uh, now we were all together in this facility. And I think in that first 90 days, uh, and certainly let's call it the first six months, um, people were here. They began to understand who we were and what value we were to them and to the community. You know, when we first started, there were centers that were very curious about what we're doing. And I think everyone thought, oh, this is the gear you're going to have. You're going to have this same gear for the next 20 years. And that's not the model we've taken on. The model we've taken on is, okay, let's make sure we keep on that forefront. That's what's going to keep it so we don't have cameras that have stuff falling off of them. One of the things that I think the community has come to appreciate is the value of the technology that exists. That's been the great thing about this place is we're instead of just trying to get by we're actually trying to make sure we give people something better and give more and give more. So the first channel we took was channel 15 the community channel but as a part of our agreement, as part of the franchise agreement, not long after, we took on two education channels. We decided to actually turn Channel 27 into college and Channel 28 into K-12. Now, the K-12 channel was brand new. No programming, nada. You know, we have no operating dollars to actually hire an education channel coordinator or uh, to create programming for the, for the uh, Channel 28 for K-12. So we got creative. I brought it up one day as kind of this wild and crazy idea at a board meeting. I said, why don't we give some equipment to the schools? Why don't we put out a competitive grant process and give equipment to some schools and then we can ask them for programming in return? And you know, to our board's credit, they were all over it. And not only is it programming for the channel, not only is it great for our students who are now gonna be learning how to use these 21st century tools. So we allocated half a million dollars of our um, capital equipment budget uh, for that year and uh, put out a MAP grant, Media Access Project, uh, Media Access Program Grant uh, to the school districts. That's just a huge milestone for our organization, um, and it's one of the best decisions we ever made. Uh, here we are a couple years later, we're going into our second round of the MAP grants, and the stories are just inspiring about what these kids have learned, the stories they're telling, um, the skills they have, the confidence they have. It's really inspiring. I have to say that one of the most important relationships that we have is with the Knight Foundation. Knight Foundation is very much about supporting in, informed and engaged communities. Knight is one of the few funders that, that understands the need to invest in grassroots media. We support innovative strategies and ways for people to communicate with each other, get the information they need in a timely and relevant way. Uh, to connect with each other, to build community. One of the first programmatic grants we received was from the Knight Foundation. And it was also uh, in concert with San Jose State's Anthropology Department. And the project was Silicon Valley Spark Plugs. And it was identifying and, and uh, interviewing, researching, and doing documentaries on grassroots activists that are pretty underground in Silicon Valley and use technology in interesting ways. This is the story of a very special place in Japantown and its evolution over three generations. Following the Silicon Valley Spark Plugs project, uh, Create TV embarked on uh, an annual gala fundraiser, friendraiser, uh, called the Creative Awards. And, you know, the first person I went to was Judy Kleinberg at the Knight Foundation. I said, we've got this idea. We want to launch this as a way to really recognize great work throughout the Bay Area, great community media work. I said, would you be our title sponsor? And she kind of thought about it. And 
not long after she causes absolutely. The Creative Awards are a wonderful way for people to actually build relationships around the storytelling and videography that Create TV is so well known for. And you know, that investment is huge because it was seed money to get not only this, this event off the ground, but it's that unrestricted funding that we needed to start building on early in our operation uh, to grow. We're going to have a, you know, an awards, uh, sort of a film festival and an awards gala that doesn't celebrate the topic of the video as much as it celebrates who's making it. First year, we were able to recruit Steve Wozniak to be a presenter, and that was huge. Steve was willing to step up and be there, um, and really that gave our event some serious clout. And it really is a gathering place for innovators and community builders to see each other and support the creative side of San Jose. So we started at the San Jose Rep year one, which was wonderful. It was just a beautiful place, but we realized that night we got to go bigger. We moved year two and year three to the California Theater, had more presenters and some VIPs coming in, including Doug Stanley, who's the executive producer of The Deadliest Catch, Ed Asner, uh, record uh, video uh, congratulatory messages and supportive messages for community access. Darla Anderson, who is the executive producer over at Pixar. One of the other guests that we had at this last Creative Awards, which was, was awesome, great, brought this whole new element, was DeAndre Brackensick, who uh, was a finalist in season 11 of American Idol. Um, and he, he generously you know, came in and was able to be a presenter and perform, which was just awesome. You know, one other thing we did this, this past year that was very meaningful and certainly a milestone for our organization was we partnered with Adobe Youth Voices to um, put equipment into several, around seven, community sites that serve underprivileged kids and at-risk kids. Through our partnership with Create TV, um, they've been able to donate about $60,000 worth of equipment. Uh, so that they can use the Adobe Youth Voices curriculum to make documentaries and tell their stories and make music videos and express themselves. It's really great to kind of just see the transformation in terms of, uh, you know, finding a passion for some of the stuff that they're doing. These tools, these digital media tools, um, the training, the stories, you know, everybody should have access to that, especially our young people. You know, you really start to see the transformation a little bit um, just by building self-confidence, uh, learning to really uh, think critically. Uh, also, um, just be able to uh, gain digital and media literacy as well. So Create TV San Jose is, uh, has public and education channels, and we serve those communities. We had an opportunity to respond to an RFP at the city um, to provide video production services. You know, in our mission statement, it says, you know, civic engagement, I mean, using media to foster civic engagement. One thing we have is a lot of the Create TV folks take care of the daily media needs of the city, of making sure that the meetings are recorded, that they are transmitted so that people can view and connect with the work of government. It's so one of the sort of milestone projects that we did was for the Hispanic Foundation of Silicon Valley. Uh, they came to us and said that they wanted to, um, you know, tell the story uh, via video that would really complement their whole Latino report card project that was going to be unveiled at a community event. So I was able to get a meeting with Sid Espinoza and to talk to him about some of the, you know, educational initiatives uh, that we were contemplating at Create TV. And I remember him saying to me. You know, I get asked to do a lot of these meetings, but I remember seeing that Latino report card video that you guys did, and I knew I had to talk with your organization. And that was very validating for us. It's like we were making, and we are continuing to make, meaningful work that's touching people and connecting communities. So because of that video, it led to Microsoft giving us a, a funding to launch a series called Mad Science San Jose. So Mad Science is airing on Classrooms Channel 28, and it inspires young people to pursue, contemplate, think about careers in the sciences. We partner with the City of San Jose and PG&E to pursue funding for uh, Cortezi Climate Kids Club. This is really modeled after Supervisor Dave Cortezi's program, which uh, he takes to, I think, primarily middle school. Uh, to talk to these students about being good environmental stewards. Folks are starting to come to us in the community because they recognize that, you know, our channels do attract eyeballs and, and people know who Create TV is. And that feels really good. It feels like God, we're doing our job. We're getting the word out there. You know, and Ladoris Cordell, who's an independent police auditor, came to us and said, you know, I want to start a series here on Create TV. I think 
you know, we need to um, really talk about what the Independent Police Auditor's Office does, you know, and interview folks on, on, uh, on the show and uh, tell the story. The Independent Police Auditor's Office has been around for 20 years. It was started in 1993. And it wasn't until this last couple of years we've struck up this partnership, and it is fantastic. I've had my team leadership council come here and do the first ever public service announcement, and it was a fantastic experience for them. We premiered that PSA at the city council chambers, and they watched themselves up there with city council members watching them and it being premiered. You can't put into words what that does for young people who, many of whom felt that really they weren't worth much and weren't going to do much in life. And it has just changed everything. Your voice matters. So call today. I think we're off to a tremendous start. I think, you know, these five years have been uh, very full. <laughs> no grass has grown under anybody's feet here. Uh, when I look at the next five, ten years, if I could name sort of one thing that would be an overarching goal and something that we intend to pursue, it's, it's bridging that digital divide and making sure that every kid and every teacher has access to the equipment and the training to use that equipment well, not only in the classroom, but in life. Um, I'm hopeful that in the next five years we, we, we won't lay back on laurels but figure out how do, we, how do we really push it out into the community. We're just a vehicle. I imagine if you will you walk into a branch library and, and there's a maker space where people are making, editing, producing their own videos, TV shows, uh, right there in the library, being able to check out video equipment with a library card. And that uh, the making of videos, the making of art, the, the making of, uh, of information technology is something that is shared across the city. So CREATV is really a, a tool in the community for building community spirit and helping people to see opportunities for engaging with each other. I want to continue my partnership with CREATV. Uh, this is groundbreaking. If you talk about public access TV, it's changing lives. So you can't put it down on paper as some you know, identifiable success, but I can tell you it has changed lives for the better. I feel like CREATV can get us outside of our bubbles and help us understand each other more because we don't just put stuff on the air that we agree with. We put all voices on the air so that we can have a better understanding of each other. In the next five years, we're looking to really continue our partnership with CREATV and our goal is to reach uh, you know, a thousand plus kids in the community. I see a media center like ours becoming sort of a community media hub. Right, it, it'll be the way that people communicate and our job in the city will be to make sure that that's accessible to anybody in the city who wants to tell their story almost anywhere that they want to tell their story. I guess I would say the future is whatever we want to make it. I'm confident as one who's been involved in the beginning that it will be as good or better than we've experienced in the first five years. These five years are the beginning of a phenomenal journey. And I want to say thank you to Create TV for getting people's voices out and heard and making sure that those voices have an influence on the decisions that affect their lives.